that there was never a deal that Ned couldn't make more complex. <laughs> uh, and Ned would say, you know, it's important if you can do a lot of business with this guy, you love him. It's important that you can resolve commercial disputes over dinner, not go to court. <laughs> Early in my career, after he spent time teaching me, anything I did, if I'd call him, he'd say, will I get out at the same time and at the same price as you? And if I would say yes, he'd say, okay, save me the rest of the story. What would you like me to do? <laughs> if you're going to have an enduring relationship with an intelligent counterparty, that you ought to strike fundamental as opposed to emotional agreement. If you want to open with me, I would say, uh, I have an opportunity that I think is uh, selling for half its intrinsic value. And the reason for it is that it's a commodity that everybody else loves to hate. Now, immediately, you hit all of my hot buttons. <laughs> Thank you for talking to me, Rick. I, I wanted to ask you three things. Could you describe your history with Ned Goodman? I met Ned sometime around 1977 or 1978. I was uh, also being mentored by one of the best geologists I ever met named Hugh Mogensen, who at that point in time uh, worked for Butel Goodman as an analyst. And we were doing, an, uh, I was doing an oil and gas workout uh, that Hugh had been involved in. And so Hugh uh, introduced me to Ned Goodman sometime in the late 1970s. Uh, and I was, well, first of all, I'd, you know, obviously heard of Ned uh, in and around a lot of things, being involved in the natural resource business. I, I was struck immediately by a wonderful sense of a guy who, although he didn't do technical work himself, was a great consumer of expertise around both geology and engineering, and a guy that had an absolutely instinctive sense for finance around extractive industries, or as I used to put it years ago, turning rocks into money. Uh, I was also struck by a guy who was extraordinarily generous with his time, with a young guy like me. Uh, he spent tens of hours with me. Uh, I suspect attracted to my energy, uh, if nothing else. He was to the point where his mind was better than his legs, I guess. <laughs> I still had legs. Uh, and, and I was struck, too, uh, by his abiding interest in the ascent of humankind, which is to say he wasn't just kind to me. Uh, he really, truly uh, wished well for the world. I'm not saying he always wished well for his competitors, Tommy, by the way. Uh, he, he was a highly competitive guy and understood the nature of his business. But I would say that he was smart, that he was curious, that he was generous, uh, and at his heart, at least if you weren't in his way at that particular moment, uh, he was extraordinarily kind. Yesterday, I was talking to uh, Peter Brown, yes, uh, Can Accord founder, and Peter was describing how in the uh, aftermath of the windfall affair in the Royal Commission, uh, that Toronto's mining stock business was moved out of, driven out of town, and Peter tried to pick up that business with the Vancouver Stock Exchange and the BCSC in Vancouver. And I think Peter was saying that a large portion, majority of trading in Toronto at that time was these penny mining stocks. And when the business was shut down there, it, it totally died. And he said that as a young broker, he could barely afford to keep the lights on. He got a call from Ned who said, hey, I hear what you're trying to do and I want to support you. And um, Peter said, which, you know, he, he's a colorful person, but he said, I'm not sure if, if, it, if it wasn't for Ned, if I would have made it. Wow. He said, he, and then he said, probably I would have, <laughs> but uh, they had this incredible story with Hemlo in the 1980s and Brown was telling me how Murray Pezum's margin calls had forced him to sell his control block in Corona. Brown said that he bought it and he called Ned because Ned had done him so many favors and sold it to Ned. Um, in 1977 or eight, when you met, I don't think Ned was yet a household name in Canada. Definitely Hemlo made him that. Um, but did you have, uh, exposure and uh, a view of sort of the business he was doing at the time when you met him? Yeah, he was certainly uh, a household word in oil and gas and laterally in 
uh, mining finance. Uh, household word is perhaps the wrong phrase because most Canadian households, like most American households, can't spell either oil or gas. Uh, but certainly in the industry, uh, Ned was one of those rare providers of capital that uh, listened <laughs> and took into account the presentation. He wasn't one, he understood that he wasn't one necessarily that made his money <laughs> by not writing checks. He was willing to take considered risks. Uh, he was willing to take considered risks on people like Murray Pezum, um, a, a wonderful but lethal salesman, uh, if ever there was one. Uh, and also Hughes and Lang. You know, Ned played both sides uh, of the Corona game, uh, or pardon me, the Hemlo game, and in fact won twice. Uh, but before Corona, while he probably wasn't too well known to the readers of the Financial Post, for those people who were in extractive industries, particularly in the exploration part of extractive industries, Ned was a very important and very influential player. Uh, were, were you privy to or do you, do you know the genesis of the Franco Nevada story in 1983? Were you around? Did you know much about that name? I had the extraordinary good fortune of being allocated 10,000 shares of Franco Nevada at 35 cents in the initial public offering. Did you take uh, it? I did. Uh, <laughs> I did. Uh, and at that point in time, uh, it was an idea. It was nothing more. Uh, Seymour, <laughs> it's true, had had a fondness for the royalty business going back to his oil and gas experience. So he had a, he had a fondness for royalties that was at that point in time 10 or 15 years old. He understood them to be probably the best part of the capital stack uh, in oil and gas and then the mining business. But my understanding uh, of the of the Franco Nevada genesis was that they actually saw an advertisement <laughs> for a royalty in a Reno newspaper. Uh, and, you know, uh, having been in the process of blowing their brains out at Alligator Ridge, probably thought, you know, we could do worse. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if that's the true genesis, but I I certainly recall uh, discussions during that period of time uh, between Seymour, who came to figure, who came to uh, favor the royalty approach, uh, and Ned, uh, who had a much more aggressive company building approach. Hence, the difference between, say, Corona uh, and Franco Nevada. Did you do you remember who who offered you that that chair position? I would suspect, I, I mean, the answer to that is no. I would suspect it was Hugh Mogensen who said, you know, I've I've got an allocation for you and you're out of your mind if you don't take it. These are all wonderful people. Uh, as I recall, there was no cheap stock in that deal. Uh, everybody got in the same price. There was no penny stock issued to anybody. There was no warrants issued to anybody. There were no options issued to anybody. I could be mistaken on that, but as I recall, uh, everybody came at the same price uh, and the same time. There were some people who were allowed to come in much bigger than peons like me, uh, but that was probably the fairest offering in the history <laughs> of the TSX. I think um, from what I read, it looks like uh, Shulik was Seymour Shulik was maybe the junior a junior partner at Butel Goodman, and Lassonde was the gold analyst there. And That's through, through new new venture equities, uh, Goodman Control Vehicle, he helped them start the company and fund it. And obviously, they bought the royalty out of the newspaper. That That's what I've read, too. And that's where the gold strike discovery happened subsequently later. I, I think they paid $3 million and had received over $1 billion in dividends. $2, two million. million. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah, $2 million. And and received um, over one billion of dividends from it. Like, and I recall, by the way, Tommy, nothing to do with Ned, but I recall clearly seeing uh, the news release from release from Barrick on the gold strike strike discovery. There was a drill hole that was aptly named the Screamer, uh, because as I understand that a hawk flew by when they were trying to name it. Uh, and if my memory serves me correctly, that was almost. 300 meters of 30 gram rock. Uh, it was an astonishing hole. The crazy part of reading about that is I, I, I'm an amateur Peter Monk historian. And uh, Adnan Khashoggi, the arms dealer, and Monk had this um, success in hotels in Australia and, and yes. Australasia. 
and they wanted to get into the gold business after some failures in oil and gas. And apparently their first call was to Ned, who helped them get into the Canadian mining business and subsequently into that uh, that later opportunity, which I think they found on their own. But um, Ned told, or uh, Peter Monk told John Goodman that uh, Monk blamed Barrick on Ned. And I found this, it's crazy that he had the royalty through Franco Nevada. And when I learned about his history, like if you tell Goodman manages 40 billion, he started dynamic funds, which had 90 billion under management. And they sold it at, in 2010 for $3.2 billion. It's like the perfect exit of a mutual fund manager because who, who would have wanted the business today at that price? And in 1984, Three, Ned lobbied the finance minister to extend tax breaks to regular investors, expiration tax breaks leading to the boom of the flow through business. He raised $5 billion in flow through with CMP funds. And so, and then Dream Unlimited was a real estate manager with 25 billion under management. It's like his, his success in financial services is unparalleled and his success in mining seems to be unparalleled. Beyond the advisor to Barrick, the co-founder of Franco, he was the founder of Kinross, the founder of uh, Dundee Precious, a co-founder of Repadre, which I didn't even know about until I went down this rabbit hole, and right. a key backer to all these deals. And it's it's just like unfathomable that one person could have such a role in our market. Well, certainly early in my career, uh, after he spent time teaching me, uh, basically, uh, anything I did, if I'd call him, uh, he'd say, will I get out at the same time and at the same price as you? And if I would say yes, he'd say, okay, save me the rest of the story. What would you like me to do? <laughs> um, many, many, many times, uh, Murray Sinclair Jr., uh, a Vancouver resident who I believe you know. I don't know him, but I know of him for sure. And, and I would make uh, bridge or mezzanine loans to companies that exceeded our ability to fund. <laughs> and our first call was always to Ned uh, for two reasons. He loved the senior part of the credit stack. You know, he loved to be a high yield debt owner rather than to be an equity owner. But Murray and I also knew that none of the junior mining companies would dare screw Ned. <laughs> they might not pay Murray and I. <laughs> but they wouldn't dare uh, not pay Ned. And so he was, in addition to being uh, an invaluable part of my intellectual genesis, uh, he was an important funder and syndicate partner in, in my uh, early career. Do you remember? Um, do you remember any specifics of what you learned from him? I would say that what Ned was best at was picking talent that he believed to be simultaneously competent and honest and, and then listening. <laughs> I remember Ned telling me, uh, don't pay too much attention to established geological models. Let the rocks tell you what they are. If you try to fit them into a box uh, associated with your exploration thesis, often you will miss data because it doesn't conform to your paradigm that's useful in determining <laughs> um, what becomes. Uh, Ned also taught me, I suspect, well, maybe life taught me, but Ned was both persistent and tenacious. Ned simply outlasted many of his competitors. Many competitors today have trauma holding stock over a long weekend. They think the fact that they want to go up, that they want stocks to go up uh, in a period of time that will enal enable them to, you know, meet their auto lease payment or something like that is germane. And Ned knew that building companies took five years or six years or seven years. Uh, Ned was also a, a believer that you had to look after your investors first because they were your constituency. The issuer wasn't your constituency. But that part of the package of looking after your investors was making sure that at least on success, the managers did well. Ned was not a believer in high cash compensation. 
for company executives, but he was a believer uh, in fairly fulsome uh, options packages, and he was also a believer in bonuses, provided that the bonuses were issued in return for realizable goals. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is that Ned had a very rational sense that everyone should win, of course, in their own order. Do you think that there's anybody like him or that have, has there been anyone like him? Like who, who would you compare him to? Uh, I'm not sure in the resource business uh, in Canada that there is. Um, the people who are Ned's equivalent uh, have most often gone to the issuer side rather than being on the agent side. I mean, when I think about somebody who has tenaciousness, uh, access to good commercial skills, and access to good technical skills, I think of Murray Edwards. Uh, but Murray, of course, went to the issuer side from being an attorney really quite early. But probably the best conjunction of the skills in the mining business is Ned's old partner, Seymour. Uh, you know, wily old fox, uh, who, again, has wonderful listening ability, uh, doesn't try to tell a deposit what it is. <laughs> um, you know, they were, uh, although they went separate ways, they were an amazing uh, combination. Ned, uh, I, I remember Ned, uh, don't take this wrong, but we would be talking about somebody that we were thinking about invest investment with. And Ned would say, you know, it's important if you're going to do a lot of business with this guy, you love him. Uh, it's important that you can resolve commercial disputes over dinner, not go to court. <laughs> and I, I think that was useful. Uh, there was occasion, I, I know well, and I won't mention the names, but there was an occasion where I had invested with somebody who I knew, knew Ned. In fact, Ned introduced me to this person. And it turned out that this person was viciously, viciously anti-Semitic uh, and had said some things to Ned, uh, probably while under the influence of alcohol. I remember Ned called me up and said, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor, which is to say, never do business with this guy again for the rest of his life or your life. I realize you do substantial business with him, and I will see to it that you suffer no loss, no financial loss <laughs> as a consequence of this. But I would consider it a personal favor, <laughs> um, which was interesting to me. Uh, you know, did you oblige him? I'm, I'm assuming you did. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, given what Ned had done for me in the first instance, and then in a very calculated sense, the amount of money I had to make from this other person relative to the amount of money I had to make from Ned. Uh, in fact, I liked Ned and I didn't like the other person anyway. Uh, I did business with him because it was easy business to do. Uh, but when Ned asked me and told me the reason, um, I said, yeah, I'm in. Um, Ned had obviously the the litigation experience with him <laughs> um i don't yeah, i didn't know. have lots of litigation experience <laughs> <laughs> i i didn't know the story but but so ned got control of pesum's corona right and right after the discovery lack minerals came to site to see the core and consider an investment and they learned proprietary information about it they then staked around it and outbid corona for the neighboring ground where they found a larger mine and built it. And with Ned as the controller backer of Corona in a David Goliath situation, sued Black, which was a major. And after I think a seven year suit was awarded the, the new mine for Correct. costs that Black had put into it. And Corona doubled on the day and, and Lack split 50%. But I what I read is that nobody saw that win coming, right? Nobody thought that this little junior could outbox the major when the major had breached a fiduciary duty to it on that site visit in 1981. I, I talked to Ned a reasonable amount of time during that time, and Ned absolutely always believed. Uh, he believed in the efficacy of the rule of law. Uh, he believed that the facts were on his side. Uh, he had absolute faith. I didn't. Uh, I, I had no faith in American or Canadian justice when it came to fairly complex commercial matters. Uh, but Ned had absolute faith. Uh, and I don't think that Ned, at least publicly, ever expressed any doubt whatsoever uh, that the Canadian courts uh, would find in his favor because 
from his point of view, he knew he was right. Uh, I, I thought that faith was charming myself, but I didn't share it. You you mentioned complexity, and one thing that <laughs> when I've been doing research about Ned is that his dealings were far more complex than anything I've ever seen. And I heard that in the 1980s, there was a, a illustration done in a newspaper about Ned in front of a whiteboard with all these related companies and completely filled with words. And at the bottom, it said something like, easy, right? Or yeah. And I have a copy of that somewhere, Tommy. If if you could, I've looked everywhere for it. If you could share it with me, yeah. I would be very grateful. Apparently, I'll, it was it was on T-shirts at some point, but yeah I'll, yeah, I'll try and dig that out. And it is true that there was never a deal that Ned couldn't make more complex. <laughs> uh, he had a he had a fondness for that. Partly, uh, that was because uh, Ned believed that Ned would serve Ned's interests the best, uh, and so he was always interested in things like uh, dual. Uh, you know, dual share structures where there was a super voting share. Um, Dundee Corp today has uh, 100 correct. to 1 votes with the 3 million shares that the Suns have. And uh, that's correct. But and Ned, Ned was uh, famous for wanting cascading structures where uh, uh, a share class controls the company and that company controls three other companies. Uh, and those companies invest in each other. And it's yeah. like, so yeah. for me, for me trying to make this linear, I'm like, I'm, I wouldn't say struggling, but I'm, this is more, this is more difficult than other stories I've looked into. We're, I, I think we're the author of these schemes, uh, a person of lesser integrity. Uh, I would have been more angry about them. Uh, but the truth was that when Ned said to me, uh, I'll come in if you and I go out at the same time. Uh, that's the way I was always treated. Uh, Ned always treated me fairly. And I came to the point of view that if Ned was structuring something in complex fashion so that he could maintain control, and I wanted him to maintain control, <laughs> to the extent that there was no financial disincentive to me, uh, uh, it, it came not to bother me. I will say that it made due diligence yeah, from Lord. my point of view needlessly <laughs> complex. Yeah. Uh, so t today there is a crisis in mining capital markets. I mean, I don't know if you feel that way, but there is no net uh, who's taking shots on projects at, at scale and has the capital that he has. I mean, maybe Eric Sprott, um, who's done a, an immense amount for the business, but you know, the the capital is not there. The institutions are not there. The flows are in index funds. And I'm wondering, like, what do you tell uh, issuer how to, if you're not in an index fund and you need capital and your story is uh, struggling, how do you tell a, an, is, an issuer to to build a market today? Well, that's a, that's a very non-NED related question. Uh, I would argue with you, by the way, that uh, Eric's skill sets are what the market needs now. One thing Ned was not was a promoter. <laughs> His fondness for complexity, when he would tell a story, would leave most investors cold, while Eric's message is much simpler, <laughs> much more promotional. So I would argue that in the early stage company, uh, Eric may be more useful to the industry than Ned, although Eric uses just his own capital, and Ned was able to command a much broader amount of capital. Going back to your question, though, uh, I think that the malaise that confronts mining equities is the fault of the industry itself. Um, I suspect that investors going back to the decade of the 70s uh, have looked at mining stocks as being leveraged warrants on commodities more than anything else. They've looked for leverage to the commodity price. Ironically, the most leveraged companies are of course the most, the most marginal. <laughs> if you're a high cost producer. When the price of your commodity goes up, you enjoy more man, more margin expansion than a low cost producer. So for 60 or 70 years, the investor has asked the mining business to exhibit leverage, which is to say be marginal. And boy, has the mining industry complied. Yep. I mean, there's almost no more marginal business on earth. If you dial our market back to the period 2000 to 2010, the gold price is up, what, sevenfold? And the free cash flow per share of the XAU declined. And now the mining industry says, why are we having trouble raising money? 
it's because for the last five decades, it was always send us, all, send us new money, old money, all gone. <laughs> Investors are sick of that. And, and, and with the juniors, it's worse. What was nice about Ned is that he was reasonably good at, in movie parlance, segregating the good from the bad from the ugly. Uh, he would back high quality people. He was a lead order, but he would say to the brokerage industry, these terms and conditions are stupid. Uh, I'm happy to take 19.9% .9 of the print, but it's going to be on these terms. These terms that you've proposed are merely a way for you to garner commission from stupid investors. And I'm no stupid investor. <laughs> I would argue with you, Tommy, that the mining industry isn't short of capital today. When good placements, or at least placements that I think are good, come up, including over the last year and a half, I invariably get cut back. You know, a company goes out to raise $20 million, they come back for 32. I put in for X, I end up bidding two thirds of X. And heaven forbid, from the issuer's viewpoint, they have to give me a warrant. They seem to be very generous with themselves with options. <laughs> uh, but, but, but you see the dichotomy between like a, a growing story that's made a discovery and it's being developed or maybe even a, a smaller miner that if if they don't qualify for an index they're orphaned right certainly certainly the industry has come to understand the benefits of amalgamation and, and larger trading volumes but i don't think that that is the primary reason for the demise of the junior mining sector i think the junior mining sector's own failures are the cause of its own demise. Uh, if you see a deposit, reunion would be an example, snow line would be an example. There's plenty of money around for high quality people doing good work and not spending too much money on GNA. Ned was a great book, uh, a, a great uh, lead order. Uh, he probably in terms of Canadian exploration, as a consequence of his pioneering in the flow through shares, deserves more credit than any other single human on the planet, with the possible exception of Peter Brown, uh, in terms of the genesis of Canadian exploration. Uh, I think we have to give him that. Uh, I don't think that the lack of Ned, uh, or Peter, for that matter, uh, functionally retired now, although still writing checks himself, uh, I don't think that the passing of those two gentlemen has had as much to do with the current funding difficulty that the Canadian mining industry uh, has uh, simply because I think it's the fault of the industry. And you also have some other, if you will, uh, titans coming up. I think it's fair to say that Frank Juster's come of age. His model is different than Peter Brown's uh, and his model is different than Ned's. He isn't a guy necessarily who writes checks to other people's deals. He shepherds his own deals and he is certainly no longer a broker. But I think we've come to the point where there is a substructure of people, and there are certainly quasi-family offices, the Friedlands, the Lundines, <laughs> people like that. I think that the industry has adapted. Uh, I think that the lame, the halt, and the blind, which is to say most of the issuers, haven't adapted, and hopefully they'll go extinct. Uh, you you mentioned Frank, and I I um, I guess I. If I can ask you about Eris Mining, and this is a story that I know really well, and I'm I'm a shareholder of it, and and I'm it comes to my question about um, about these orphaned companies, right? It's like Eris Mining has uh, the best metrics of any small gold producer, and and it's cheaper than all of its peers on all of its metrics, and but it lacks the trading volume. Uh, to qualify for GDXJ at scale or GDX. And I think it's in a special place that, you know, 450 US market cap that will be self-funded with 500,000 ounces of production at 1200 costs in two years with 170 million on its balance sheet. Like, I don't see how that stays a 450 million market cap company. But in the meantime, it's half the price it should be, in my opinion. And, and so does a company like Eris have to be subsumed to get the value that it deserves? Or should do they just wait and do what they're going to do and the market will weigh it eventually? Like what, what do you do in that situation when you're not 
the GDX so star. I, I need to disclose conflicts of interest. I'm a shareholder of Harris. Uh, and I was a shareholder of Endeavor before it. I'm a Woodyear fan. Uh, so I, Me too. Before we go on. Let's disclose conflicts. Uh, I think the description that you gave of the company is not quite accurate. Uh, I would suggest that there are still some unanswered questions with regards to continuity of grade. And I think that there's still some unanswered questions with regards to the politics and the sociology of Marmato. Uh, this is my second time investing in Marmato, <laughs> and I've been there. I don't know if you have. No. Uh, if you go there, uh, I, I think that the sociological problems can be can be solved. And I think that Woodyear's the right guy to do it, having done it in frontier markets before. But I think that the market is um, uncertain about the political direction of Colombia. And I think Colombia's on again, off again fascination with mining means that the concern that the market has expressed is valid. I think the market should be concerned about mining in BC. Hmm. <laughs> you know, people tend to be more concerned about political risk that they don't know about. But I think there is some concern. I think the market's concerned about the sociology around Marmato uh, and Antioquia generally. And I think that's valid too. Uh, I think there are concerns uh, around the drilling density at Marmato and the ability that the company has to live up to the projections that you've discussed. I own it because I believe that they will, but I can understand the criticism that they haven't yet. Hmm. I get that. I, um, I haven't heard that. I, I knew that, you know, the, the Marmato lower mine project that's now started, they're taking it from uh 20,000 or 30,000 ounces a year to 200, I think for 20 years, that's the plan. Right. Uh, but I, I just uh, assume because of who I'm dealing with that um, whether it's Neil and and uh, Wheaton who's funding it, that they have you know sufficient information to move forward with a bill, right? But I you think they're going to get it done. Understand that uh, Silver Wheaton's funding it sequentially. Uh, yeah. you, ha you, you have to o overcome... Um, you know, there has to be sequential progress to answer and answer questions. Wheaton invests the same way that retail investors auto invest. They trust, but they verify. Retail investors have a very different paradigm. Got a hunch, bet a bunch. Uh, <laughs> and that often doesn't work, particularly when the hunch is politically incorrect, which is to say Columbia. Um, I happen to believe that fears over political risk in Columbia, well, well, while well-founded, uh, are unduly discounted compared to political risks in other jurisdictions, places like the United States and Canada, which I believe are riskier than the market gives them credit for being. So like Endeavor was was a, a dog stock for five years, was flat and growing, and, and then in one year it appreciated 5x, and that was 2015 or 2016. So it's like after the market the, woke up to it, right? After the check started cashing, you will remember that Endeavor answered a series of unanswered questions. Endeavor did two things. They answered a series of unanswered questions and they grew by amalgamation. Uh, Frank, to his credit, uh, understood that what you needed to do was get sufficient scope and scale uh, and sufficient trading li liquidity that the index funds had to buy you. Uh, the acquisition of Semifo was both about uh, combining the Semifo and the Endeavor assets uh, to create a, a very solid West African competitor and to maximize the joint pipeline. It was also about getting uh, enough heft and enough trading liquidity that the various index funds had to buy it. Do you think that there is a story like uh, Eris or one that is... Um, you know, would be suited to an amalgamation with it? Like, it's tough to, for Eris to merge with somebody that has a premium price, you know? And if you are trying to get to the I, GDX... I don't think that they are or should be interested uh, in an amalgamation now. I would love to see some form of Northern South American amalgamation amongst, say, Reunion, say, G2, say, G Mining, uh, say, um, Eris, uh, and if I'm really allowed to fantasize, uh, Lundin Gold. 
uh, I'd love to see something like that happen. Uh, it's crazy, but for me, looking at those stories, like I love Oco, and yeah. and that's got a six hundred or five hundred Canadian market cap. Yep. Uh, Lundin Gold's three billion. Yep. One one great mine, and uh, Dave Fennell was was joking with me that he thought the Oco would be as good as it. Um, they're different different grade but the simplicity at oco and the scale is very impressive yep um g min g mining that's that's close to a billion market cap yep and so I, but I, I guess I, I see i see uh, a reunion on a path to something like a a mini lundine in, in potential and and that's what g min is too a smaller project but but there's Eris Orphan that's cash flowing today. That's the same value, nearly. I mean, it's it's bigger, but then the, just the deposit in the ground. And Eris has four huge projects and cash flow. Yeah, so I think the deposit, the, the market cares about one deposit in Eris, which I, I suspect in the near term, Neil cares about too. Is that Soto Norte? I, pardon me? Is, is that Soto Norte? Yeah. Uh, I, I think too... Uh, that with regards to the challenge in front of reunion, that the challenge is less formidable, as you suggest. Uh, it is uh, socially. one deposit. Uh, I mean, they have a neighbor and that amalgamation, it would be nice if that amalgamation would take place. Uh, although I guess the management teams are uh, less than past friends. Um but the job ahead of them is relatively simple, relatively non-complex. Uh, and the ore body shows every sign of wanting to get bigger, uh, which is pretty nice. If you're, but Pinnell if has you're... also evidenced, unlike most of these other guys, a real willingness to transact, uh, even if he doesn't come out uh, in the control shoes. This is, is... This is uh, Pinnell? This is Reunion? Yeah. yeah. So I, th I think that helps. Uh, with regards to G mining, uh, they were an orphan stock for a while. Uh, they have, I think, done a very good job finding a constituency for their story. Uh, Genyak I, background plus plus the Egyptian billionaire, right? Who well, helped they've also, I, I, I think they've done a, a better job than most Canadian miners finding a constituency themselves that wasn't delivered to them by the Canadian investment banks. Uh, looking outside the ranks of traditional North American gold mining investors to find uh, very large family offices around the world who came to believe in their tra track record, came to believe in the Lundin imprimature. The Lundins were very generous in terms of crediting the Gignac family with successful uh, on-time, uh, on-budget completion at Fruta del Norte, which was by no means a simple task. Uh, Early in its car incarnation, there was ra widespread condemnation about G mining in Canadian capital markets because they called them lousy promoters. In fact, the Gignac family <laughs> didn't want to go the route of traditional uh, investment bank led Canadian promotion uh, and instead charted their own course. By the way, the same course that uh, Endeavor had partially chart it charted 10 years earlier. Uh, my suspicion is that Neil Woodyear will be able to do precisely that uh, with Eris. Uh, I think like the Gignac family, it'll take him 12 to 18 months to do it. But I think uh, going a different route than the route uh, that is so Bay common Street. in Canada yeah. Yeah, uh, will pay dividends. Uh, and my belief is that Neil, given his past successes, uh, and the tenacity of Frank behind him uh, will be able to fashion his own constituency. That constituency is out there, Tommy. Uh, it's just that most issuers are too lazy to access it. Uh, most issuers seem to believe that you ought to be able to call up Haywood, uh, and then you ought to be able to call up BMO. You ought to be able to consign uh, market building and financing to those two outfits, uh, and, and the game ought to be over. But that's not the way the game is currently constituted. And I think the success uh, in G2 in building their market cap in a non-traditional sense is really excellent testimony to that. So that's that's G-min. I think G2. G2. G2 G, G, I'm sorry, G-min. Yes, G-mining. 
So, G1. but G, G2, you mentioned that's G2 gold fields, right? Yeah, it's right across the, the property line from Reunion. And I, I believe part of the same mineralized event, uh, very different uh, rock response. Uh, G2 thus far is more higher grade, discrete veins, uh, whereas Reunion is a very different ore body. But my suspicion is that they're part of the same mineralized event. And I would love to see them at some point in time combined. Does, does G2 have, is that the old Aurora mine? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but does that, did they have a mine startup that, that didn't go well there? Like, was that, was that, a, was there a mill and everything built or no? There may have been a very small scale mill. I think, I think there, there are a couple Guyanese stories that, um, uh, I forget the name of the predecessor, but I, um, I've watched Reunion and, and talking to John Goodman about it, they have 16% of it. I mean, he's, yep. he's like, he, he, according to, according to him, they, he was backing them looking for 500,000 ounces in Saprolite, thinking that it could be a simple milling, profitable mine. And then, you know, they've got 6 million ounces that could be much more. And it's a super success. And uh, it's now 88, it's now an $80 million position for Dundee Corp. And their market cap is 85 million. And they've got, yeah. you know, 300 million of other assets. Do you follow Dundee Corp, the stock at all? Do you know much about? Um, I do. I, I do. Uh, I need to say its predecessor, Dundee Bank Corp, yeah. was one of the great wins of my career when it was spun out of Corona. Uh, when Corona was taken over by Homestake, it was a total orphan. If my memory serves me well, and they it was spun out, it traded for 41 cents. Uh, I wasn't astute enough to buy any at 41 cents. It took me till it was 55 or 60 cents before I understood what Ned was trying to do and the fact that it was a total orphan. But I'm delighted to say, by the way, partly without me, uh, it went from, you know, 40 to, 41 or 42 cents at the bottom to $42 at the top. I think it had a three for one split, maybe even. Like, I mean, it, was, it, it was astonishing. Now, uh, it would be disingenuous to say I held every share. Yeah. From, well, you know, 50 yeah. or so <laughs> cents to 40 or so dollars. But the truth is, it happened so quickly uh, that I was able to hold uh a large number of shares, uh, and uh, I benefited mightily from Ned's effort in that name, both in terms of my own personal net worth, but importantly, my own uh, reputation. My book was littered with Dundee Bancor. Well, they they had a huge success in asset management and and uh, and other investments, but but in 2014 they um, really hit the wall, right? Like the stock dropped 90 percent in four years. Right. And and so it seems like John, uh, you know, he's been leading this restructuring, selling assets, buying preferred shares back. And now they have this, I wouldn't say pristine stock, but you got a 90 million market cap with 300 plus million of assets and that team. And, you know, the Goodmans have about uh, 12 or 13 percent of the stock. But John seems really focused on like like the family legacy and making it good again so i am I'm, I'm kind of i'm a believer in it and it's it's a little illiquid to buy it that's that's part of the challenge but i like it now i do too uh i i need to spend more time with john uh, i've known him a little bit for a very long time <laughs> again uh marie sinclair jr who was uh his partner at dundee precious the fun i think right yeah, um, Marie uh, is a shareholder and former director and, and has told me that I should, quote, do my personal balance sheet a favor and get long. When Marie Jr. says something like that, uh, it's usually pretty good advice. Yeah, I've, I've heard so much about him, but uh, he remains an enigma to me. Um, John described the two of them with Dundee Precious Metals as a fund. They had a 23% annual return from 92 to 03. That's like pretty good. Yes. And yeah. on, one, on one site, John in 1993 was at Yanacocha. And uh, he said that Buenaventura, my, Minas Buenaventura had a 15%, um, had a 40% interest in right. Yanacocha. And uh, John was able to sort of beat Newmont to buy 7% of it for their fund. And they made 15x in three years as a as a three million ounce a year mine was built out of profit, not equity. 
Uh, I'll, t- I'll tell you a similar story, but the best stock market win of my career was Paladin. Uh, I've heard you describe it in the in past. Australian year. Uranium Junior. And I had bought a bunch of stock at a dime, financed them to see it fall away all the way to a penny, <laughs> which shakes your faith. Um, mercifully, I had the courage of my convictions. I bought some more stock, although not at a penny. Uh, and then the stock started on the way up and at a dollar. I decided that I would sell enough stock that I had my bait back. So I was selling some stock and uh, I got a call from Murray John, who used to work for Ned. And he said, Rick, you can do what you want, but the buyer of that stock you're selling is Ned. Uh, You (laughs) might want to think through the sell side. (laughs) And of course, it went from that dollar to $10 in, I don't know, four years, four and a half years. Uh, A very shrewd guy. No kidding. Um, We... We spoke um, briefly, or maybe it was email. I was wondering if you could tell me your story about meeting uh, Stephen Roman Sr. You're a great storyteller, and I don't know anybody who's known him directly. I'm embarrassed to say that I don't know when I first met him. Uh, I was 50 years ago. (laughs) It was a long time ago. I do remember having uh, lunch with him, and if my memory serves me correctly, uh, it was in the bar of the old highs uh, in Toronto, the original highs in Toronto. Uh, And I remember him as a very good storyteller, uh, an oblique promoter, uh, which is to say he didn't begin his presentation with the close. He didn't try and say, this is a 25 cent stock that's going to go to $3, which is the normal Canadian open. Uh, He was much more of a Robert Friedland style promoter in the sense that he would begin his pitch with the state of the world. Uh, I think at Xerox, they used to call it foundational selling. He would get you to agree with two or three big picture statements uh, before he would get more and more and more focused on where he wanted the discussion to go. Uh, I I found him a fascinating human being. He was uh, mission-driven, which is a very good thing, but his mission at the time that I met him wasn't of any particular interest to me, so he never did business. Uh, What was his mission at the time? Do you remember? Pardon me? Was it the Slovak cause? or Roman Corp, basically. Uh, He saw himself uh, as an emerging uh, merchant banker, uh, and uh, with the probably the sole exception <laughs> of D- Dundee Bank Corp, uh, I have never invested in a merchant banker that worked for me. <laughs> so, um, you know, that model, uh, while he was of interest, uh, wasn't of interest to me. I, another uh, really little known thing that I have found very consistent among very good natural resource investors is that they're collectors and buyers of redundant databases. And Roman was always bragging about the fact that he, bragging's the wrong phrase, he was always discussing with, discussing with interest the fact that he had bought, as an example, the Pathfinder database or some other database. And you know he would say, I can't believe that these companies are selling me uh, data that they compiled for $150 million and they're selling it to me for $100,000. And I would say, you know, what are you going to do with it? And he would say, I don't know, but it's going to come in handy. <laughs> and I've heard that from other good investors very, very, very commonly. I've never been lucky enough myself to get one of these discarded major mining company databases. Uh, but I do remember uh, with fascination that Roman was extremely interested in buying uh, intellectual capital for a penny on the dollar, with no immediate sense of what he was going to do with it. Just that there was some knowledge in there that if he was smart enough to plummet, would come in handy. Could you describe a definition of of merchant banking? Uh, Well, my definition is a sort of a holding company that invests both its capital and its talent in developing affiliates. Uh, Dundee Bank Corp was, of course, the classic uh, successful 
It sounds like a, fan, a nice way of, of describing a house street promoter too, right? Well, uh, except for that the house street promoter tries to use your money. Uh, right. <laughs> in, in the case of the legitimate. And, and, and I would suggest that the Lundin family uh, are merchant banks. They're just not public merchant banks. Uh, yeah. I would argue that Ross Beatty, uh, I, I would argue that in the oil and gas business, and in some senses in the mining business, that some of these serially successful families are private merchant banks. Uh, they don't allow you to participate uh, in the parent company because the parent company is closely held uh, and they don't feel that they need you and they don't feel like they'd like to talk to you in terms of how they allocate their own assets. But I would argue, as an example, that the collection of trusts that form the basis of the Lindine family uh, and the management company, Namdo, uh, have the effect of being a, a private, non-public merchant bank. And I would suggest that Kestrel Holdings the Ross Beatty family uh, has functioned in much the same fashion, answerable to themselves, <laughs> using their own money, but using their own money to grow a stable of affiliates. In in Romans, um, in some of the readings that I, I did about Roman, a journalist said that he described that his faith floods a room. And you you mentioned that he set a theme and got you to agree before he made the pitch. As a writer, and a communicator, you know, I, I always got to think about how do you grab people's attention right away? And so by saying a 25 cent stock's going to three bucks, at least I've set the tone and you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. You think it's better to do the Friedland or Roman approach, or do you have to earn it by being a, the equivalent of a billionaire to have that sort of gravitas? I don't know, Tommy. Um, I certainly understand that if you're going to have an enduring relationship with an intelligent counterparty, that you ought to strike fundamental as opposed to emotional agreement. Um, if you're a guy like me and you start off by saying, I have a 25 cent stock that's going to go to $3, my usual first response is tell somebody who cares. You know, I don't want to know. If you need a headline like that, um how does it, how, so how do i get how do it, i how do i open with rick rule with a pitch it, it raises oh well if you want to open with rick rule uh, i mean you know me well enough you've listened to my bs for years uh if you want to open with me i would say uh i have an opportunity that i think is uh selling for half its intrinsic value and the reason for it is that it's a commodity that everybody else loves to hate now immediately you hit all of my hot buttons <laughs> i forgot, <laughs> well, you, forgot you forgot warrant <laughs> well, yeah, that, well, that, that, I mean, when it comes to the deal terms, you know, then 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 we have that discussion. But I, ha you know, I have to care about the investment before I care about the warrant. <laughs> yeah. If I don't so, think the investment's worthwhile, I don't care particularly about getting the right to buy it at a higher price if I don't think it's going to get there. You you said something, and I, I'll I'll wrap up soon. But you you mentioned um, databases, and you mentioned, um, you know. Roman and uh, there was the Fennell story where he relentlessly pursued the Anaconda database to get. To, I think it was uh, it's a pause in Suriname that oh my, yeah. but I I wanted to bring this together by by describing this man that I know. Uh, his name is Denny Laviolette. I don't know if you know him. He, I know of him. Yeah, he's the, I think he's the VPX at Newfound Gold, and he used to work for Sheldon Inventosh. He's my age. So he kind of grew up knowing how the sausage was made, but he put together with Colin Cattell this portfolio, including right. Newfound Gold, and he's made a big fortune on Newfound. So he's, he's, he's. I, I don't want to say he's puffed his chest out, but he's like he has no fear of what you're going to think of him. Right. And, and but he's also very charming, and he's from uh, Ottawa originally, but he's got this like down home geologist charm. But the I'd say I think that his wealth from the discovery has made him more confident and 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 he so he's letting his hair down in the way that like when he's promoting his companies he's like he's describing oh this thing's like a frankenstein uh no you know and he's he, it's 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 kind of like what i'm what i'm getting at is roman and friedland they had huge success which changed how they can market themselves because they bring to the room their track record and i'm i'm wondering was there a difference like with Robert in 1980 versus or 85 versus 
today in the way he would pitch Rick Rule. Robert is now, uh, obviously he can pitch based on his reputation. What is consistent is that Robert is so smart. What happened in the early 80s is that you would have a couple of conversations with Robert where Robert would just ask you questions and you would think, where is this going? Where it was going was that he was debriefing you. He was finding out what your hot buttons were. He was finding out how to persuade you later. He was absolutely lethal because he was smart enough and he could segregate data in his mind well enough that he could tailor his pitch to fit your parameters. He knows too many people now <laughs> and he doesn't have time to do that. And I think probably that process was from his point of view, fairly degrading to him. He becomes a much less lethal promoter now mm -hmm. because <laughs> he doesn't pitch me uh, on the basis of a 100 <laughs> percent uh, ability to understand what's going to be important to me uh, ironically to me he's a he's a less effective promoter now uh i know this cost of capital will be low <laughs> he doesn't yeah. have to tell me that he's a great promoter i know that he attracts great people uh, and he pulls unbelievable stuff out of them he motivates people like nobody else in this business so, a great in a sorry go ahead in a sense, he doesn't have to be as lethal as a promoter as he was. And I don't mean lethal in a bad sense. I mean that when he was determined to sell somebody something, before he started selling, he got to know them well enough that he could customize his own pitch. The pitch that he would give to, say, Peter Brown at that point in time, or Ned Goodman at that point in time, uh, or me, were very, very different pitches. Each pitch geared to his understanding of the value of the person he was pitching. He was unique. I've never met a salesperson with his skills. When I was in the Congo with him 10 years ago, and, and I, I, had, I didn't know him, but I knew, you know, the famous salesmanship of him. And he got quite frustrated with me. You know, he looked at me, he's like, why do you keep telling me to promote the stock? You know, come back in 10 years, this, this mine will be built. And like, so he, I, 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 I felt that he no longer wanted to do that. You know, he's like, I, I think that's absolutely correct. I and he doesn't he have probably, to. I think he probably found the process demeaning. Yeah. Um, and, and I understand that completely. And, and the truth is he doesn't need to. Uh, Robert I've got a 17 billion market cap or something now. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we've talked about a lot of people now, but Robert remembers very well that I was there for him and Ivanhoe mining uh, at 65 cents, 66 cents, 67 cents. Uh, he appears at my conference in Boca Raton every year, not because he needs to, uh, but rather because he believes maybe someday he'll need to. And, and at any rate, uh, because I was loyal to him, uh, he's loyal to me, which is a, a wonderful thing for a guy that's accomplished what he's accomplished. Part of why I mentioned Denny uh, was that we we were describing the data sets. And so Denny bought uh, CEO.ca, which was a great favor yes. to me, right? But he also bought the Northern Miner for like Correct. three million bucks. Yep. And and you know he got Mining.com with that acquisition, so that's a pretty valuable domain. But you know, on one hand, it's kind of crazy because media business is is uh, insane. But there's 125 years of mining stories in there that yep. I think could yep. be interesting. Um, and anyway, I, I just like I, I've been noticing recently, like. Uh, success lets people sometimes be more of themselves. Sometimes that's bad. Sometimes that's good. Um, but anyway, watching the characters evolve is 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 really fun. And and it's well, it's I'd great. I'd like to learn I'd like to learn more about that stock. You may know I'm a reasonable shareholder at Aspermont. Uh, having watched, having watched Agora grow, um, I'm uh, attracted to the media and information business. Well, that actually is a, it's a great stock for you. And I know somebody who has a block. <laughs> we should that, talk. That business, uh, that business is like, it's $55 million of securities. Uh -huh. Northern Miner CEO.ca, a 2% royalty on newfound gold and a bunch of cash. And the valuation is 27 million. Yeah, if I know the securities, I'm probably unlikely to pay full price for that oh. part, but I sure like the rest of it. 
but 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 I'm saying is that the, the yeah, I get it. It's yeah. huge. It's 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 a basket case of inequity. Like it's trading at a huge discount too. Yeah. No, I, I'd be very interested in knowing that. Um, uh, I think I might be able to help them uh, in two senses. Um, I think I might be able to help them. Oh, on a little the content side. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I, I I'm pretty good if I believe a stock is selling for less than it's worth, causing other people to know that it's selling for less than it's worth. No, you're you're that that would be a, a game changer for them. They they should talk to me if they were uh, prepared to do the right thing. Uh, I might, in the right set of circumstances, uh, sign some form of binding letter. I'm uh, I'm attracted to dollar bills for fifty cents, uh, particularly if I'm comfortable about the fact that there's a dollar there. One of the challenges. Obviously, the, the the mining securities are super speculative. They own a bunch of juniors, which are going to get written down this quarter because it'll be for the last yep. quarter. Yep. But um, but yeah, I mean, one of the one of the things that I think affects the stock negatively is is you know Eric Sprott actually he's the largest shareholder with fifteen percent, and I think yep. obviously he's passive because it's he's so wealthy and has all these these yep. investments. But um, you know, and Danny has been he's got this huge position in newfound and I think he's been, he's, he wants to own more of it, but, but the insider alignment is a piece that I think they're going to try to fix. And yep. maybe that's the Rick. Opportunity. Wait, you know, I have some history with Eric and from my point of view, it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Eric uh, gave you the giant liquidity event, right? <laughs> well, it it yeah. wasn't really a liquidity event. I haven't sold a share. Really? Uh, not a share. Uh, what Eric did is my business made a lot of money, but there was no ongoing concern value. If I'd gotten hit by a truck, my heirs, successors, and assigns wouldn't have gotten anything for the business. Uh, and so that's what that's what they did for me. Uh, liquidity event assumes that you sell stock. No, I'm, I'm, it, I, I meant uh, diversification opportunity. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. What it did was um, crystallize in a permanent sense, the intangible value that I had created uh, around the global brands. What um, what do you do with the the success you've enjoyed? Like you you were in a, in a video recently wearing a Hawaiian shirt. Yeah, and it, it doesn't seem like you you consume your money, uh, uh, but yet you're motivated by it, right? <laughs> so yeah. what is what does money do for you? I'm wearing a shirt now that's emblazoned battle bank i'm celebrating retirement by starting a new bank uh my seventh by the way uh i like to create wealth when i well when the second of my wife and i shed our mortal coil which is to say when we're both gone uh effectively our entire estate uh is going to go to philanthropy uh any other heirs successors and assigns have been looked after already. Uh, and as you suggest, uh, I'm not particularly a consumer. My new car is 14 years old. Uh, I live in a very nice house. I didn't succeed in downsizing with regards to my house. I hope you come visit me sometime. Thank you. I would love to. Uh, but I'm down from three houses, <laughs> you know, so I have downsized in one sense. I love uh, helping people build businesses. Uh, I love entrepreneurs who find a need in the market uh, and find a way to serve it. Uh, at the last bank, uh, which we built, Everbank, uh, we recognized a need in the market. We recognized that the branch banking system in the U.S. wasn't serving the mass affluent consumer, but was adding cost. Uh, and we understood that Americans wanted to save in currencies other than just the U.S. dollar. Uh, it took us 14 years, but we built up a 275,000 saver constituency around that before selling the bank. Similarly, uh, after I sold my business to Eric Sprott, we recognized that there was a whole class of Americans who wanted to own publicly traded oil and gas in a vehicle that wasn't, uh, pardon me, publicly traded precious metals in a vehicle that was tax efficient, that wasn't an ETF. Uh, that's now uh, the Sprott Physical Trust business, a $26 billion business. There was a huge market segment to serve, and the market wasn't serving that segment. Being part of building those very large franchises 
uh, serving underserved portions of the market that I know well is something I just absolutely find fascinating. I don't need to do it myself anymore. You know, at age 71, uh, I'm past prime time uh, in terms of being a CEO, but I love assisting young entrepreneurs who have identified a market need and a way to fulfill it. Uh, the other thing I do now is I'm, I spent 50 years, Tommy, learning how to make money. And thus far, my track record giving it away is fairly spotty. Uh, you know, the old harm, the old dictum, uh, do no harm. Uh, I'm not sure I've always done no harm giving away money. So I'm going to spend the next 10 years <laughs> learning how, because I'm going to give away a fairly large amount of money. <laughs> and it's I'd not, like to do it's good not an easy it thing. Hard. It's not an easy thing to do because as a, as a libertarian man that you are, we know that it's better to teach a man a fish than to give him a fish. Well, it, you know, in particular, I have a, a philosophical aversion to giving money to a philanthropy that takes government money. Uh, that means from my point of view, uh, if I give money to an outfit that takes money uh, from government, uh, you know, I feel like I'm benefit, I'm benefiting from the proceeds of crime. Uh, and, and that limits uh, the outlets I have. What most, most of my estate will go to organizations that are uh, at worst, or pardon me, at best antithetical. Uh, and, and more likely hostile <laughs> to government. So is it is is uh, there a theology behind your philanthropy? Like, will the libertarian stuff that you do will will you support that sort of an issue? Or is it, what what, yeah, cert what is certainly the problem? certainly the Atlas Foundation, certainly Students for Liberty, uh, libertarian group, like Ross Beatty and Tom Kaplan. I'm interested in uh, environmental causes, but free market environmentalism. Uh, I'm interested in the work that, as an example, the Nature Conservancy does, uh, buying habitat and setting it aside. I'm interested in the work that Tom Kaplan does, uh, saving big cats. If you save the top of the food chain, uh, almost naturally, you've saved the rest. So I, I do that. And I'm also very uh, interested and invested in economic empowerment. So I've been investing reasonably successfully in microcredit for 30 years, uh, establishing banks in places like India, uh, Somalia, um, uh, the West Bank, uh, that loan money to very, very, very poor women, generally women that have no collateral, <laughs> interesting way to bank, uh, and providing economic opportunity through credit uh, to people that otherwise wouldn't have it. Uh, and I've, I mean, these banks have enjoyed really tremendous financial success, although they're nonprofits. Uh, and the human success that I've been able to enjoy vicariously, uh, women that were absolutely destitute, who now employ 20 other women uh, and are part of feeding 20 families, uh, has been very gratifying to me. What, uh, for the last question, Rick, what are you most looking forward to personally right now? Uh, probably the growth of Battle Bank. Uh, what, is, I, what is the what is the launch product of Battle Bank? Uh, we will be a nationwide branchless bank uh, operating through the internet. Uh, rather than having fifteen deposit products designed to hoodwink customers, <laughs> we'll have one deposit product, a high yield money market account, so that you can earn interest on your checking account. As an example, we'll have certificates of deposit in twenty two currencies not just the U.S. dollar. Uh, we'll have uh, IRA products that aren't just repositories for mutual funds from financial institutions, but rather IRAs like your RRSPs uh, that can own a duplex or a triplex, uh, can own an owner-operated franchise, can invest in private equity. Uh, we believe that our customers' IRAs are just that. They're IRAs. And we've developed legal structures to allow people to invest outside the norm uh, in their IRAs. Uh, amusingly, on the lending side, one huge opportunity. Uh, we believe that there's in excess of $30 billion in precious metals bullion held in segregated accounts in the U.S. And nobody banks it. <laughs> so uh, establishing credit facilities for the gold community, a community that I know how to talk to <laughs> and understand because I'm one of them, 
is, I think, a huge opportunity. Uh, when we started EverBank in 2000, the backlog of people who wanted to do business with us, that is to say our waiting list, was zero. With BattleBank today, pre-open, uh, that list is above 12,000 on the way to 13,000. Uh, EverBank grew in substantial measure through the assistance of the editors of Agora, uh, who liked uh, our unique products and liked our approach to market. Uh, Battle Bank uh, is owned as to about 20% of the bank by Agora and their editors and their publishers. So I would suggest that between my list uh, and between the 275,000 former customers of Everbank and the efforts of Agora, that our customer acquisition cost will be very close to zero. If you combine a customer acquisition cost close to zero, uh, a business plan narrowly focused on a few sectors that we know well uh, and non-interest uh, bearing expenses that are uh, in the best decile in the industry as a consequence of having um, no branches. Uh, I, I think you have a recipe for a really, really, really successful bank, just like the last one. Will, will you put it in a penny stock so we can all buy it? It is unlikely, uh, I hope it doesn't go public. Uh, it may, that'll be up to the shareholders. Uh, the last bank grew so fast that we had to take it public because we couldn't keep pace in the equity side with the deposit growth. <laughs> and the founders ran out of the ability to fund that growth. Uh, if you take, uh, you know, you need uh, seven or 8% uh, of deposits by way of equity to be a well-capitalized bank. When you take the bank from zero to 28 billion, obviously as private check writers, uh, even with fairly substantial retained earnings, which we had, you can't keep pace. Um, I believe that because this bank won't enjoy the mortgage refinancing boom that Everbank enjoyed, that our uh, pace of growth will be slower. Uh, I view this in the first five years as more of a dividend machine. Uh, should the shareholders decide that they want to grow it faster or that they want liquidity, uh, then we'll take it public. Uh, when, I'm, when does it launch? Uh, that's up to the FDIC. Uh, the FDIC has had more significant challenges in the last two years than my bank, I'm afraid. Um things like First Republic Bank, Silicon Valley Bank. It seems that my file wasn't at the top of their desk. Uh, we believe that we've answered substantially all of their substantial questions now that they've asked them. <laughs> and our hope is that we'll be open this summer. How many uh, co-founders do you have? Well, the real co-founder is Frank Trotter, uh, who co-founded with David Galland. Everbank. Everbank, uh, on my living room floor, by the way, many, many, many years ago. So he's the real co-founder. Uh, there is a private, well, there's a private family office in St. Louis that is the other leading shareholder. Uh, and then there's a variety of shareholders, including, uh, uh, I wouldn't call them a coalition, but a group around Agora, uh, Agora Inc., uh, Bill Bonner, uh, you know, as a, as a person, uh, and then uh, officers, directors, and employees of Agora. They own about 20% of the bank at this stage. Uh, I, I want to ask you about Bill Bonner, but maybe next time because I've taken too so much of your time. One of my favorite topics. One of my favorite people in the world. So okay, well, let me let me book it in a quarter. Or so with you, thank you so much for your time today, Rick. Great. Pleasure. Uh, we, should, we should have a discussion to Peter Brown sometime. Oh, uh, he would kill me. <laughs> he uh, would, he's uh, he's such a unique character and. You may know that I began my career in Vancouver in the bar business, and the consequence of that is that I I have two trails on Peter Brown. One, the House Street Daytime Trail. Daytime and nighttime. Cut, cut, the other one is the Hornby Trail, or maybe the Daytime Trail and the Nighttime Trail, but they're both amusing. Well, I, I had a lunch with him once, and uh, it, it, it was 12 hours, and yeah. I'm still recovering from it. It was six years ago. <laughs> so, having lunch with peter requires a formidable liver <laughs> i uh he's such a trove of material like you that uh you could mine it for a long time and i hope to do that and i'd love to come back to you and do this again great i, I look forward to it i i love talking about these old guys they're great thanks uh, for being so generous pleasure. rick pleasure pleasure hey. they were all generous with me tommy